I invite us now to attend to the reading and hearing of our scripture lesson this morning taken from the prophet Isaiah, the 65th chapter, verses 17 through 25. Now, there are only 66 chapters in uh, the book of Isaiah, and so this is near, very near the end of uh, Isaiah's writings. And uh, generally speaking, we ought to pay attention to what we might consider last words of any prophet, and that's what we're dealing with here. So hear this passage and Isaiah's marvelous uh, prophecy or description of the blessed and beloved community of God. For I am about to create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating. For I am about to create Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in my people. No more shall the sound of weeping be heard in it, or the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant that lives but a few days, or an old person who does not live out a lifetime. For one who dies at a hundred years will be considered a youth, and one who falls short of a hundred will be considered accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be. And my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity, for they shall be offspring blessed by the Lord and their descendants as well. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. But the serpent, its food shall be dust. They shall not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, your servants wait upon you, and we pray that the words we speak, the meditations of our hearts, would be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So we come today to the last Sunday of the year. Wait a minute, it's not December 31st. No, I mean the last Sunday of the church year. Christ the King, we call this. And it's a good time to reflect on the fullness of our faith, the deeper meaning of our faith. Just like Thanksgiving is a great time to reflect on those things for which we are grateful and those people in our lives for whom we are grateful, who we love and who love us. Well, Isaiah in this passage is giving us a snapshot of God's vision for us, of what it is, looks like when we live into beloved community, the beloved community of God, and when that community finds its fuller expression, its full fruition. What does that look like? Well, of course, Isaiah is writing in this particular part of the book of Isaiah. Most scholars think that this section from chapter 40 all the way to chapter 66 is written at a time that followed the exile of the Israelites in Babylon, the nation of Israel, led away into captivity for 50 years two and a half generations, a time when they lost everything they valued, the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed and desecrated, the walls of the capital city 
of the nation itself led away, those that survived the siege of the Babylonians were led away into captivity and forced to become Babylonians, to worship a different God, to speak a different language, to acquire different customs. They almost lost it all. They almost forgot their covenant with God. They almost gave up on being God's blessed community. But not quite. And as this section of Isaiah is writing to the people of Israel, writing to you and me, we're, he's writing to a group of people who are looking to come home, looking to restore and rebuild, looking to uh, reestablish their faith, reestablish their relationship with their God, reestablish their covenant, reestablish their purpose and their mission. After a searingly bitter time of exile, when they were unable, unable to sing the songs of Zion, now they have the opportunity to come home, to make a new start, to be the people God called them to be. God says that God will bring a new heaven and a new earth, and this transformation will reach from the heights to the depths. It will cover all of life, all of existence, and everything in between. The heavy memories and burdens of the past will be transformed. They will be no more. They won't be forgotten, but they'll no longer have their power, no longer have their dark fear and weight. Joy and gladness will replace weeping and crying. Long life will be the order of the day. Everyone will enjoy the fruit of their own labor. Everybody will live in their own houses and eat from their own vineyards and herds and fields and produce. They will enjoy the fruit of their labor. No longer will the rich and the powerful, even foreign powers, keep their heels on the necks of the poor and the desperate. No one will labor in vain, and no children will be born into grinding poverty or the horror of war or the despair of abuse. Not in God's beloved kingdom. And the mantle of peace, shalom, blessing, will cover all the earth. So much so that the wolf and the lamb will lie down together, the sheep and the ox will eat from the same feeding trough. The lion will no longer rip and tear and kill. Nobody, nobody will hurt or destroy and study war anymore. Like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be, says the prophet. You know what research scientists have told us in recent years about trees? They've discovered that trees communicate with sh and share with each other in the forest in ways that only the mystics had ever imagined. Research has uncovered pheromones wafted on the breeze that a tree will release so that the other trees know that there is danger. That that tree is under attack, say, from gypsy moths or bark beetles. The downwind trees catch a whiff of that signal of danger, and then they begin to release and manufacture defensive chemicals. So the trees talk to each other, and the entire grove benefits. A beloved community. Scientists have also discovered that trees have an amazing capacity in their root systems to put out strands of fungi that can live among the root systems and spread out through the soil, intermingling with the roots of the nearby trees. And these fungal strands draw minerals from the soil and exchange them for carbohydrates, which are then passed on to the trees that are struggling, the trees that need a boost. That's why we see groves of trees in the forest, trees of the same species, that will produce an abundance of nuts every three or four years. 
the stronger trees are helping the weaker ones. So they're all lifted. They're all cared for. They all have a better chance to thrive. Beloved community. So when the Lord says, our years will be like the years of a tree, it means more than long life. It means harmony, cooperation, shared abundance, helping the weaker and needful ones, standing together against threats and attacks, being a beloved community. God knows we need beloved community today, my goodness, even when we don't realize it. Maybe especially when we wallow in our competition, in our greed, in our contentiousness, in our divisiveness, in our hatred, our bigotry, our pride, our prejudice. When our fear and suspicion and hate become the order of the days and with stiff necks and hard hearts, we try to make our way through life screaming at each other and threatening each other and calling each other names. Well, just read the newspaper, listen to the reports of the latest from our politics. Man, it's bringing out the worst in us. But God's vision is something else. God's vision calls us together. God's beloved community is the place where we not live in fear, but live in belonging, not live in isolation, but live in community. In God's vision, we all care for the least of these, our brothers and sisters. And God invites everyone to God's holy mountain where no one will hurt or destroy. And Lord, help us. We need this vision of a beloved community in the church. Just now, as we wrangle over issues that plague us, whether it's human sexuality or the role of bishops or how to interpret the book of discipline or how to interpret the Holy Scriptures, we wrangle and fuss over that about which God says so little, and we neglect that about which God says so much. Theologian Richard Rohr puts it this way, practical, practice-based Christianity has been avoided, denied, minimized, ignored, delayed, sidelined for too many centuries and by too many Christians who were never told that Christianity was anything more than a belonging or a belief system. We belong to our own little club, our own little denomination. We're even afraid to go across the street to worship with folks at a different church than ours because somewhere along the line we told us we'd burn in hell if we went over there and had anything to do with those folks. My goodness, we've lost our way. But we know better, says Richard Rohr. We know that there's really no Methodist or Catholic way of loving. There's no Orthodox or Presbyterian way of living a simple and nonviolent life. There's no Baptist or Episcopal way of visiting the imprisoned. There's no Lutheran or Evangelical way of showing mercy. If there is, we are invariably emphasizing the accidentals which distract us from the very marrow of the gospel, the heart, the center of the gospel. I love the way Catholic pastor, excuse me, Quaker pastor Philip Gully puts it in his book, If the Church Were Christian. What a, what a title. That's a good book to, to write, perhaps. If the church were Christian. He says, if the church were Christian, it would be about affirming people's potential as more important than reminding them of their brokenness. If the church were Christian, we would be about the work of reconciliation and value that over making judgments. We'd be about gracious behavior and seeing that as more important than right belief. 
we'd understand that inviting questions is more valuable than supplying all the answers. That meeting actual needs is more important than maintaining institutions. That peacemaking is more important than power. Yes, the vision God gave through the old prophet still resonates today. It still nourishes our soul. It still beckons to us in our heart of hearts. We know it's true. We know that all the, the mess of the world is not the way of Jesus. We know that God's beloved community calls to us, shapes us, forms us, invites us in and provides us a place where we can be the fullest, most real, most authentic, most genuine child of God that we were made to be. It meets our deepest needs and it satisfies our souls as nothing else can do. And we share in this vision every time we gather around this table and our holiday tables and our Thanksgiving tables with friends and family, as well as with persons of every time and place and tribe and people, including those who lived in the spaces we occupy many, many, many thousands of years ago. We share in that vision every time we allow the Lord of life to find us and feed us and claim us and nourish us as we serve him. So, as we come to this table, as we come to our Thanksgiving tables, we can all pray, come Lord Jesus, our guest to be, and bless these gifts bestowed by thee. Amen and amen.